I want to take you on a journey through the Word today. Much of my library of some 20 plus thousand books were bought on my knees. Now, some, not, not prayer, but though I prayed in that God I would help me buy some of these books. But let me explain to you what I mean. I have a lot of old books that were bought in old used bookstores around the country, and I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for Summit International School of the Ministry because that whole library is up there to help the next generation of young pastors that are going to be going into the ministry. So all those books that have been collected over the last 40 years of ministry are now in the hands of the next generation. But I had a book strategy that I wanted to share with you real quick that I, what I used to do to find some of the treasures that are up there at Summit and in my library. And let me just tell you what the strategy was. When I would go into an old bookstore, I had one thing that I would do. I would get down on my hands and knees and look on the shelves at the lowest bottom part. And it was there that I found some of the best treasures that I have in my library today. For this reason, when people would walk into a bookstore, they look straight ahead to see what they can find right here when I realized that the treasures were found on the bottom shelf. And I have to tell you today, that's not just a book buying strategy, that is a kingdom strategy. That the treasures of the kingdom of God are not found standing up, it's found down on our knees where God is calling us to. F.B. Meyer, the great 19th century preacher said it like this, he said, I used to think that God's gifts were on shelves one above the other. And the taller we go in Christian character, the more easily we could reach them. And then he says this, I find that God's gifts are on the shelves one beneath the other. And it's not a question of growing taller, but for us, it's a question of will we go lower to get them. Times Square Church, the best place we can be is on our knees as a church and humble before God. Let's pray. Father, would you come and speak to us over these next few moments? I pray that God, as we begin to go through your scriptures, let the word of God begin to show us how important this is. That God, we want to be low shelf people. We want to be on the bottom that says, God, we want to find those treasures on our knee. We want to find them in humility. We want to find them on what brings God, your kingdom closer, your presence closer. So Lord, over these next few moments, would you just help us as we begin to go through your word in Jesus name. And everybody said, amen. Well, welcome to Times Square Church. Welcome online that you are watching. I want to take you on a journey today. I want to talk to you about that top shelf and that bottom shelf. I really want to talk to you today about pride and humility. There's a reason I'm doing this because it's something that God started to challenge my own life because I started to realize, and I'm going to walk you on this journey today, pride and humility are two attitudes that can quickly turn God into an enemy or God into an advocate. I, 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 it, it's going to sound strong, but it's true. It's pride repulses God, but humility attracts him. That's why pride becomes the greatest enemy and embracing humility becomes our greatest friend. See, when God sees a humble heart, it touches a soft spot of God. Humility literally is a soft spot for God. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, and I'm going to show you that today, that when people, the people of God or anybody begins to humble themselves, it's amazing how it begins. Humility gets God's attention every single time. And I want to take you on a journey today because I want you to see an awful Old Testament story that, that turns around fast because someone went to the bottom shelf. Somebody begins to literally embrace humility. I I was amazed as I watched this story get worse and worse and worse. And then all of a sudden, someone embraces humility and to see how God intervenes and how God steps in. Now, the Bible shows us this principle on two of the wickedest people in all of the Bible. If, 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 If wickedness was personified then, it would be these two names. If we were to personify wicked in the last... 60, 70 years in our country. We could go back as far as World War II with a Adolf Hitler or with a, a present day Osama bin Laden and we would think of pure evil. These two people in Bible times were in that category. And let me just tell you this time, Square Church, to make it worse, they were married to each other. Now that's a tough marriage. I'm going to tell you that right now. 
This, this was a husband and a wife team that were married together. I, I've been in ministry now for almost four decades. In about a year, it'll be four decades. And I have counseled a lot of tough marriages um, in marital counseling. And there were names that when I looked on my appointment book um, from my assistant, my heart dropped, a pit came into my stomach, and I just go, God, I need to put on the armor of God, because if this couple doesn't kill each other, I will kill them. And I just thought to myself, and I can't even tell you the stories over the last four decades of what we went through. I couldn't, and, and I couldn't even imagine, as I was looking at this couple in the Bible, I couldn't even imagine if I ever saw them on my appointment book, I, I don't even, I think I would have run for the hills at that point if I would have saw them on there. The husband is listed as the most wicked king in the Bible and the wife's name you will recognize as one of the worst women in the Bible. You ready for this? Their name is Jezebel and Ahab. How many have heard of those two names? Jezebel and Ahab. Those aren't just two wicked people. They were married together. I wouldn't even want to be near that home. I could just tell you that right now. I mean, Jezebel, that name goes all the way into the book of Revelation and into those churches. And this is a couple that begins to start the story that I want to walk you through. But keep this in mind. Jot this down. Um, pride, pride is sin. Let me just say that cl real clearly. Pride is sin. And the essence of sin, the core of sin is selfishness. It's about you. And the fruit of selfishness is this entitlement. I feel entitled. I deserve this. I have a right to this. I demand this. Let me, let me give you some top, and, and some top shelf and low shelf uh, a, a thought here. Jot this down. The pride, get this, is concerned with my rights. Pride is concerned with my rights. Humility is concerned with what is right. What is the right thing? What is right in the eyes of God? Let me say those words again. Pride is concerned with my rights, what I want, I demand, what I feel entitled to. Humility, lower shelf, that's concerned with what is right. It was Augustine, the fourth century theologian, who said it powerfully. He said, it was pride that changed angels into devils but it's humility that can make men as angels. That's where God is calling us to. That's that bottom shelf. Even the Bible predicts, think of this. The Bible predicts the end of pride and humility. Gives you what the ending is, whichever one you want to embrace. My rights or what is right. And listen to what Solomon says in Proverbs 18, 12. He says, pride ends in destruction. Humility ends in honor. And one of the things I've seen about pride is this, is that the soil many times of pride is comparison. It looks at everything around you and all of a sudden this entitlement, this selfishness starts to come up. Um, I demand this. I'm entitled to this. I want this. It, it, starts to, it starts to come up through comparison. And then you know what, hap what happens with comparison? Comparison is the thief of joy. It takes joy away from your heart that instead of singing with Emily and the team today that says, all my life, you have been so, so faithful. All my life, you have been so, so good. You're looking at what other people have instead of looking at what God has done for you. How many, how many could say God has been faithful to me today? Then, then, then that's why we keep our eyes off other people. The craziest experiment that I heard this week was done with these capuchin monkeys, these, these very honorary monkeys. And this is what they said. They said they, they cons it consisted of a diet of cucumbers. And this is what the story said. It said the experiment said that they took a whole group of these, of these very active monkeys and gave everybody a cucumber, except for one monkey they decided to give a grape to. They said the room went out of control. And all the monkeys, you ready for this? took their cucumbers and threw it at the grape giver, not even the grape eater. So the guy that was serving the, the cucumbers, the guy that was giving it to them, they started whipping the cucumbers at the guy. And here's what I started to realize. 
we do the same thing. You know how many cucumber throwers I've seen at God? That people that didn't like what other people have gotten, what other people have had. And instead of realizing God has been faithful, God has been good. I don't have to worry about what anybody else has. I can just speak for myself. God has been so, so good in my life. I know that to be true. And you're going to see today in the next few moments, and I, have, I need you to follow with me. You're going to see the cucumbers getting thrown by Ahab and Jezebel because somebody has a grape and they got upset. Instead of being satisfied with what they have, that this story is not just about throwing the cucumbers, but they are about to begin to see something even more sinful and wicked begin to take place. Why is that going to happen? Because here's what the Bible says about this man Ahab and Jezebel. Listen to what 1, Corinthians, 1 Kings 21, 25 says. Listen to these words. Surely there was no one like Ahab who sold himself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Look at that phrase. There was no one like him because Jezebel, his wife, incited him. The message version puts it like this. Ahab, pushed by his wife Jezebel, in open defiance of God, this part took my breath away, set an all-time record in making big business of evil. You know, even that phrase, no one like him, was a phrase that was used all over the scriptures for someone that had upstanding character. No one had patience like Job. No one trusted the Lord like Hezekiah. But now for the first time, nobody would be as evil as this man Ahab. I have to set this table for you today by going through the scriptures. And I have to tell you this story, but stay with me. There's going to be a number of scriptures because it's a narrative. It's a bigger story, but you have to stay with me because the ending is going to be astounding. You're going to see an, an awful story. Get this now, church, that is going to turn at the very end because it went bottom shelf. It is amazing. I had to stand back and go, God, what did you just do here? Now, this is an important story. Some may ask, well, Pastor Tim, listen, this story is thousands of years old. Why does this story even matter for us? You know why? Because the Bible says it matters. Now, now Pastor Tim, why, why would you say that? Well, I, I don't. The Apostle Paul says it. He says in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, that these things are written. He was talking about Old Testament stories. The Old Testament of, of, of our Bible are written for our instruction, which means Old Testament stories have lessons for us today for us to embrace. And so I want you to stay with me on, these ne- on this journey through this story. Ahab is upset about someone else having grapes and he only has cucumbers. He wants something that doesn't belong to him. He's the most powerful man in Israel and he's upset because someone has a piece of property. The man's name was Naboth. These are, this is going to be an important name to remember. Naboth owns a vineyard and his vineyard is literally next to the palace. It is prime real estate and the king wanted it, but someone told him no. Here is their conversation. Look, notice it with me. It says, Ahab spoke to Naboth, the king, speaking to the vineyard owner. He says, give me your vineyard that I may have it for a vegetable garden. Because Isn't that interesting? We're talking about cucumbers and he wants his vegetable garden because it's close beside my house and I will give you a better vineyard than it in its place. And if you like, I'll even give you the price of it in money. But Naboth said to, to Ahab, the vineyard owner says to the king, the most powerful man on the planet, the Lord forbid me that I should give you the inheritance of my fathers. Now pause there for a moment. Let me tell you one of the things that I started to realize over many years in ministry. It, it's important not only for us, it's important for all of us. Jot this down. One of the ways to discover how mature we are, if you want to know if you're spiritually mature, I wish it could be known simply by the way you sang, because the way you sang was amazing. I wish I could just listen to the singing and going, Everybody in this place is mature in Jesus because they sing good. Let me tell you something. I wish it was that simple. But here's what I've learned. One of the ways to discover your maturity is watch how you react when someone tells you no. Watch the reaction that can come up when someone who's in authority says no to something that you want to do. Those, especially in Ahab's case, are those who's someone who hears yes all the time, now all of a sudden, here's no from not even a superior. 
someone who's just a landowner and he's the king. And this reaction that comes next is unbelievable because what happened when Ahab was told no over a vegetable garden, he become, oh, let me read it to you. I'll tell you what happens here. You ready for this? This is first Kings 21, four. And it says this. So Ahab came into his house sullen and vexed because of the word, really, because he said no. He said no to, Naboth said no to him, had spoken to him, for he said, I will not, there's his no, give you the inheritance of my father. Here it comes. And it says this. He laid down on his bed, turned away his face, and ate no food. All of a sudden, he becomes like a little baby pouting that someone didn't give him their garden. All of a sudden, Jezebel, the dynamic duo, wicked person number two, sees her husband pouting and wants to know what goes on. So now we go to Jezebel's conversation and here's what it says about Jezebel and Ahab. Now here it comes. Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said, how is it that your spirit is sullen and you're not eating food? So he said to her, because I spoke to Naboth and said to me, give me your vineyard or money, or it, if it pleases you, I will give you a vineyard in its place. But he said, no, no, I will not give you my vineyard. Look what it says. It says, Jezebel, his wife said, do not you who now reign over Israel, arise, eat your bread, let your heart be joyful. I will give you the vineyard of, of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And church, look at me. What comes next is nothing but pure evil and diabolical. She sets up a cold calculated murder of Naboth so her husband could get his vegetable garden and so mommy doesn't have a pouting husband anymore. That's really what's going on here. She, she says, I can't live with a pouting man. I'm not eating food. I'm gonna be crying because I can't get what I want. That's the way he reacted to know. And all of a sudden she sets up what is, has to be one of the most diabolical murders of an innocent man. She makes Naboth believe that he's going to be invited to a state dinner, that he is the guest of honor. Little does Naboth know that when he gets the invitation in the mail, that his seat assignment would be next to two assassins that are going to accuse him of blasphemy. And before Naboth can say, you got the wrong man, they take him outside and stone him to death. That this man would get an invitation in the mail. He'd put on his best suit. He'd eat the best food he has ever eaten, sit next to royalty, but had no idea that the moment he walked out of his front door, they had it all planned. Jezebel had it all planned that he was never going to walk back through his front door. He would never see his children. He would never see his wife. You ready for this, folks? Over cucumbers, over a vegetable field. The pride of this man would not let it go. And here's the part I want you to get. Just when you thought you got what you wanted, your vegetable garden, let me just tell you this. God knows how to ruin garden parties. Just as you're going, look at what I have, God knows how to step in before you can even pop the champagne, blow up the balloons while you're playing around on property that doesn't belong to you, God is about to show up. Look at me for a second. Because when all of a sudden you step in and violate what God begins to speak to us, let me just tell you something. You may enjoy it for a moment, but God is going to get the last word. I'll tell you that right now. In fact, Deuteronomy chapter 10 verse 18 reminds us that God avenges orphans and widows. And all of a sudden, he has become the advocate. You ready for this? The advocate of Naboth's children and the advocate for Naboth's widow. He has become the enemy of Jezebel and he's become the enemy of Ahab at that moment. And before Ahab could enjoy, get ready for this, before he can even enjoy his vegetable garden, God sends an Elijah to the vineyards. Soon as he thought, look at what I got. You got an old crusty prophet walking in there and that's the last person he wants to see on that day because he knew what the right thing to do was. Times Square Church, listen to me. Those online, don't miss this. 
It was Kierkegaard, the Danish theologian, who said it like this, the Bible is very easy to understand, but we Christians can become scheming swindlers. We pretend we're unable to understand it because we know very well that the minute we understand it, we are held accountable to what the Word of God says. We are held accountable to what the Bible says. He knew what he was doing was wrong. And the moment that we begin to violate God's Word, okay, Here's a part, I gotta give you a side note. This goes along with what Pastor Patrick and Rosa do. This goes along with our, not only our counseling ministry, but any counseling ministry, Christian counseling ministry. Jot this down, get this down. When you reject the voice of God, you lose the wisdom of God. When you reject what you know to be true, you will lose the wisdom of God. The next step of what God is asking you to do. God values his word. His Holy Spirit is so valuable to him that when, let me say it to you this way. Anybody ever was ever in a conversation and you were about to say something and you felt inside of you, don't say it. How am I the only one? I just want to make sure that I'm not the only person in New York City getting convicted. Okay, stay with me. You know how many times I'm about to say something, whether it's to a spouse or to a child or to a staff member or to a friend, and the Holy Spirit says, don't say it. Don't say it that way. Bring it down a notch. You're angry. You're upset. You're this. And all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit says, how many, how many have ever felt that? Would you raise your hand? Okay, put it down. How many have ever still did it? Would you raise your hand? Okay. The, uh, the God will get the liars, but stay with me for just a moment here. When you reject the voice of God, you lose the wisdom of God. When you make decisions that bypass that, you can't know what the next steps are and you need godly advice. That's why when you step into areas and you feel the consequences come against you for what you've done, whether it has to do with money, finances, whether it's to do with, with anything, it could be from lying to dealing with money, whatever it is, and you're now facing the consequences, whether it's in a marriage, it's in your job, it's with your children, it's with the courts, that all of a sudden Elijah has stepped into your vineyard. I want you to listen real close to me, Times Square Church. Those that are watching online, I feel strongly about this because this is what happens. We lose the opportunity to know what the next step is. You know what the greatest thing you can do if you've blown by the conviction of the Holy Spirit? you better find a godly person to listen to. You better find a godly man or a godly woman to listen to. Pastor Tim, what, what, why, why is this important? Let me tell you. Solomon says this. I want to read to you. It's going to, it, about six or seven scriptures, but I, I, I have to read them all to you. I, I even thought to myself, well, maybe this is too many to read, but it sets the stage of why Elijah had to show up. Listen, listen to what Solomon says, what happens when you bypass wisdom, when you bypass when God has spoken to you and says, don't say that, go ahead and claim that as, as on, your tax, on your tax form, that money under the table, that's, that's elite, you can't do that, you have to, let me just tell you something, in those moments, God says, when you need wisdom, let me read it to you instead, listen to it, this is what, this is what Solomon says, Proverbs 1 23, I'll pour my thoughts to you, I'll make known to you my teaching, this is God, God making things plain. But since you refuse to listen when I call, which means I'm telling you no, but you're refusing. You're not even paying attention when I stretch out my hand. He says in verse 25, since you disregard all my advice and don't accept my rebuke, that would be kind of that, once again, that conviction, I in turn will laugh when disaster strikes you. I'll mock when calamity overtakes you. In fact, he says, when calamity overtakes you like a storm, when disaster sweeps over you like a whirlwind, when distress and trouble overwhelm you, then they will call to me going, what do I do next? But I'll not answer. They'll look for me, but you won't find me. When you hated knowledge, you didn't choose the fear of the Lord. Listen to verse 30. Since they wouldn't accept my advice and spurn my rebuke, they'll eat the fruit of their ways and be filled with the fruit of their schemes. Folks, that's intense. What he was saying was is this, 
You can't hear from God, feel God, read his word, hear a message like this, blow it off, and then all of a sudden, when you face calamity, when you face consequences, you just think, well, I'll just do this the next step. It's the worst thing to do. That's why what happens next in the story with Elijah is this, out, an outside voice has to come and Elijah walks through, um, in a sense, Ahab's vineyard. Listen to what happens. When Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, Ahab arose, went down to the vineyard to t- and to Na- of Naboth to take possession of it. And it says, then the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, arise, go down and meet Ahab, king of Israel, who's in Samaria. Behold, he's in the vineyard of Naboth where he has gone to take possession of it. Now listen, I know this is a lot of scripture, but I need you to see how evil this couple is because it's going to get better. Just stay with me, I promise you. And how severe the judgment of God is because the ending, which is going to come up in a moment, is mind blowing. It's astounding. So listen to the words pronounced by Elijah. They're frightening. This is what he says It says, 1 Kings 21 19, you shall speak to him and saying, Thus says the Lord, have you murdered and taken possession? You shall speak to him, meaning Ahab, saying these words. Thus says the Lord, in the place where the dogs licked up the blood of Naboth, the, 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 uh, the dogs will end up to the king, he's saying this, will lick up your blood, even yours. Verse 20, Ahab said to Elijah, have you found me, O my enemy? And he answered, I have found you because you sold yourself to do evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, this is incredible and so intense, this word, that, that he says, he says, you're not going to die in a hospice. You're not going to die with your family around you singing songs of Zion or the Psalms of David. He says, you're going to be on the street with dogs licking up your blood. This is intense. I have to tell you, I, I need us to stop for a moment and make a confession. When I'm reading this story, I, and I read this prophecy that he gave to him saying that you're going to die and the dogs are going to lick up your blood. Now, Now, folks, don't judge me here, but I was satisfied. I sat there going like, yeah, you shouldn't have did it. Now you're getting the dogs. And one one part says, and the birds are going to come. So I'm going, you're getting dogs and birds. You shouldn't have done it. Jezebel and Ahab, bam, you're going down. And I, I know I shouldn't have been happy there. But what I was thinking, I was going, justice. Justice is coming. Not only are you going to die, but you're going to die like this. Now, let me just tell you something. I know that's not right. And then Ahab, stay with me now, church. Ahab messed up everything. He did something that changed to end the story so fast that I was expecting dogs and birds and something else happened. The same man who got God angry now gets God's attention. The first time he got God's attention was from murder, covetousness, and stealing from an innocent man. And the second time he gets God's attention is astounding. Can I read it to you? The word that came to Elijah. Listen, the first time says, tell him about the dogs. Listen to the second one. And it came about when Ahab heard these words. He tore his clothes, put on sackcloth, fasted, laid in sackcloth, went about despondently, and here it comes. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah saying, do you see how Ahab has humbled himself before me? Because he has humbled himself before me, I will not bring evil on him all of his days. I said, what? What happened to the dogs and the birds? You're telling me if a man that wicked who murdered and stole humbles himself before God, his life can change like that? Let me just tell you something. That's not just astounding. That's the way God is. God is absolutely amazing. All of a sudden, it says Ahab humbled himself before me. Because he has humbled himself, I'll not bring evil on him. 
Those two attitudes, God begins to say, you show pride, I showed up with an Elijah in your vineyard. You showed humility, I showed up with a word of rescue for you. How in the world does God do that? Because humility is the soft spot of God. It's when man realizes it's not about me, it's about the greatness of God. I have nothing if God doesn't step in and do this. This is what's incredible. Listen, folks, no matter what you've done, no matter what has happened in your present or in your past, humility is the soft spot of God. It gets his attention when you recognize it's not me, it's him right now. If you went to Harvard University on Emerson Hall, which is the philosophy department, how the, the, if all places, the philosophy department, when they were building Emerson Hall, the president of Harvard, president, president Charles Eliot, begins to invite a psychologist, an American psychologist and philosopher, William James, to say, what should we put above the doors of Emerson Hall, the philosophy part department of Harvard University. And Ed William James thought about it and came with the Greek philosopher Protagoras and said, man is the measure of all things. He says, that's what we need to put up there. Man is the measure of all things. When I read the story, it said that President President Eliot never contacted James again. And all of a sudden had men chisel on the front doors of the philosophy department of Harvard University, not William James's words, but let me tell you what he put up there. The morning the scaffolding went up and they're still up there today over Harvard's Emerson Hall Department of Philosophy, President, President Eliot decided that he would put up there Psalm 8, 4 that says, what is man that thou art mindful of him? Let me just tell you something, folks. There is two great divides. One is God-centered, one is man-centered. James went top shelf, the president, Charles Eliot, went bottom shelf. And let me just tell you something, can I just help you? Man is not the measure of all things, but the truth of the matter is this, who are we that God would take notice of our lives today? Who is Ahab that God would begin to respond to that man's humility. That's the great God that we serve today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You, you know, I, I have to just say this for a moment, that, pause for a moment and say this, I, I, which shows me in this story, I don't care how far you think one of your loved ones, your children, your husband is from the Lord. It just shows here immediately that God takes the most wicked man in all the Bible and humility turns God. That all of a sudden, think about it. Wherever your son or daughter may be right now, wherever your husband or your wife may be right now, wherever a cousin or an aunt or a nephew may be right now, I'm here to tell you this. If God can take the worst king in Israel's history and all of a sudden change an awful, an awful present like that, can you imagine what we could do if we started to pray for people and pray for prodigals that God would turn them? Hey, you know what? I, I want you to listen because it could be for someone in this room. How many know, not even, whether they're connected to you or not, how many know of a prodigal that needs to come back home to Jesus? Would you raise your hand? Okay, let me just tell you this. Those who are watching online, those who are in this place, can you imagine if we started connect groups praying for prodigals to come home to Jesus? Can you imagine if some of you moms, how about moms putting a connect group together saying, let's pray for prodigals to come back to Jesus. How about wives praying for spouses to come back for Jesus? How about somebody going to tsc.nyc groups and saying, we have the prodigals back to Jesus group. We're, we're, let me just say something. You can talk about them. You can complain about them, but we need God to intervene. You're talking and you're complaining is not going to bring them back. Hey, can I read to you? Let me tell you, if you want, if you want a great thought to start that group. I don't care if you're around the, around the world. If you're watching from Budapest or London, if you're watching from Manila, if you're, if, you're watching, if you're watching from Los Angeles or down in Dallas, Texas, start a group that would begin to pray people home back to Jesus. 
pray him out of a pig pen and pray him right back into the father's house. You, you want to know why? Because prayer works. Prayer works. I love what Jay Sidlow Baxter, an Australian pastor, said in the 50s. He says, men may spurn our appeals. They can reject our message, oppose our arguments, even despise you. But they're helpless against our prayers. Let me just tell you something. All the reason why we need a prayer group and not a talking group. We need a prayer group that calls God and say, only you can turn something around immediately. That's what God can do. It stops him in his tracks. That's what it takes place. Now listen, I I want to get ready to close, but I kept thinking to myself about humility. And I kept thinking to myself, why does it get God's attention? What is humility? Now you have to just just kind of stay with me on this. I, I, I in those 20 plus thousand books, I have this two volume set that when I'm reading the Old Testament, I, I kind of lean to it sometimes. It's called the theological word book of the Old Testament. And what it does is it'll bring definitions. Some people will look in a concordance to find a definition and maybe find a synonym, but this kind of brings out a nuance of a meaning. And I looked at what Ahab did. I said, what does it mean he humbled himself? Twice it said, he tells Elijah, he said, listen, the first time I spoke to you, we talked about birds and dogs. Now this time, I'm telling you, he humbled himself. Did you see him humble himself? He humbled himself. And I looked up that word in, the, in, in, those, in that context. And because the Hebrew language is picturesque, this is what it said. I'm just going to read it to you word for word of what Harris, Archer, and Walkie said in the theological word book of the Old Testament. They said this, humility means to pack your bags and take them out of the land. Pack your bags. I kept thinking, going like, what is that? Humility. I thought humility was like, oh, I'm nothing. No, no, no. This, this is, it says, it is a word picture. And then all of a sudden, I started to think to myself, that's exactly what humility is. Folks, those here and those watching online, you know what humility is? Packing your bags and getting them out of the way. It means this. It means, you know what you put in those bags? Pack up your credentials. Pack up your excuses. Pack up your accomplishments and achievements. Pack up your reasons why you did it and pack up your entitlements, demands, rights, and opinions and come to God with nothing but a sinful heart and say, God, here I am. I need your help right now. There is nothing of an accomplishment that gets us a right standing before God. There's not a degree that you hold. There's not a salary that you make. There's not a possession that you own will get you before God. The only thing that gets us before God is a humble heart. That's what gets us before God himself. I don't care what degree you own in this place. I don't care what degree you have worked so hard for. That doesn't give you an audience with God. You could be a king and Ahab, but humility gets you before God, not because what your title is. You can say, I have a BA, I have an MBA, I have a PhD, and still be D-U-M-B, because that will not get you before God. Only humility would get you. In fact, Charles Spurgeon said it this way, be not proud of race, face, or place. It is all grace that gets us there. That's the only thing. Pack up all those things. Pack them up and let's get before God and just say, this is who I am. None of my accomplishments, my personality, my charisma, my achievements, my degrees, they don't work in the presence of God. It's humility that God starts to work on our behalf. Put it all away. I was was reading the story of world champion boxer Muhammad Ali at his prime champion, heavyweight champion of the world, was on a plane going to train for his, next, for his next fight. And while he was on the plane, the stewardess walked over to him before the plane was going to take off and said, hey, you have to fasten your seatbelt. And Ali, in his own inimitable way, looked at the stewardess and said, Superman don't need no seatbelt. The stewardess looked and said, Superman don't need an airplane either. Fasten your seatbelt. Let me just tell you something. 
You can't fly, I can't fly. It doesn't matter if you can fly or not. It's humility that God is looking for. Pack it up, Muhammad Ali. Pack it up, professor. Pack it up, businessman. Show up before God and say, this is who I am. I need God today. That's what we need. Humility stops heaven. Man, if there's ever a person that you would think, hey, look at my achievements, and you see the humility, let me close with this. It's the humility of the Apostle Paul. Can I, I, I want to read to you three verses, three, I'll call them, three Pauline statements in chronological order. These three Pauline statements, I want you to write these three verses down. And I want you to see how Paul starts to see himself. We, we think of ourselves sometimes that we, the older we get, we think sometimes how much important we are, but you see the opposite in the Apostle Paul. Let, let me give it to you. I want you to jot down these three verses. Here it comes. When Paul steps into ministry, one of the first books that he penned, Here's a man who's written some 12, 14 books. Two of them are debated whether he wrote it or not. doesn't matter. One of the first things he says is this. Jot this down. 1 Corinthians 15, 9. I am the least of the apostles. Those are the big names, the big guys. I'm the least of them. That sounds humble. Of all the guys, of all the apostles, Peter and James, I'm the least of these guys. What's amazing is the Paul walks with Jesus longer and all of a sudden you see him go down another shelf. Eight years later, he writes in Ephesians 3.8, I'm not the least of the apostles, I'm the least of the saints. When I'm sitting in the boardroom with all the apostles, I'm the least of them. When I'm sitting in a church like Times Square Church, I realize I'm the least of all the saints. I'm just the least. And you know what's amazing? Can I give you the last thing he wrote about himself? Talk about bottom shelf. Remember, this is in chronological order. Just before his life was about to be over, he goes from, I'm the least of the apostles. I'm the least of the saints. You ready for this? One of the last things he wrote, 1 Timothy 1.15, I'm the chief of sinners. I'm the foremost of sinners. Folks, that's convicting to my own heart. Because we're all trying to grab hold of a title. I'm the past, I'm this, I'm that. Who cares? Who cares? Uh, I'm the least of the apostles. That's good, Paul, but you're not there yet. That's still, that's still top shelf. Eight years later, I'm the least of all the saints. Getting closer, Paul. I'm the chief of all the sinners. And God goes, I'm going to use that man. That's the man I'm going to use. The man who packed up apostles, packed up all of his accomplishments, packed up everything. And that's why I've learned this in my life. Get this now, church. Get this online. Listen to me close. I'm saying this to preachers. I'm saying this to pastors. I'm saying to ministers. I'm saying to those that lead a church or on staff out of a church. This is the most important. One of the things I have to constantly remind myself. Get this. Listen. Whether, it's, whether you're gifted as a musician whether you're gifted as a worship leader, the man or woman that's full of themselves can never proclaim a Christ who emptied himself. You can't sing about a Jesus who emptied himself if you're full of yourself. God, help me. Help me. This is nothing. I don't want to, I just, I don't, all of this, this doesn't mean anything. I want to be found at the bottom shelf. I want to be found as a man that has just embraced God and say, I am the chief of sinners. God goes, those are the people that I can use. That's not, get rid of this Times Square church. We're at Times, forget it. We're the chief of all sinners. God help us. God help us. That's why twice in the New Testament, we're always reminded God opposes the proud. Hallelujah gives grace to the humble. Humility is the is not just an action, it's an attitude. It's a it's not just a an apology, it's a confession. It's a owning it. But here's the part that got me. Here's the part that I kept pondering. 
from this whole story. I, I'm so happy the way it ended. I'm so happy he embraced humility. Ahab did. But you know what got me was how long it took to get him there. Like how long? Like, like there's a man dead. There's a family that lost its father. And there are children here that have no father. That There's not a dad that's going to walk those daughters down a a, 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 a walk them down in their wedding like like how long is it going to take for someone to wake up it's not till a man is killed and inheritance is stolen and a family is left without their father how long does it take to to make things right how long will it take to get things right i i want to make it as simple as i can today how long will it take for any of us to make things right and here's the good news if you're breathing you can get things right today. If you can hear, you can get it right today. If you can hear me, you can be changed. Online, around the world, right here on 51st and Broadway, you can be changed. But it's, it's packing up the bags, getting rid of them, and saying, God, you're in charge now. This is your plan. Okay, lock in here, here it comes. There's this crazy story that I was reading about a ship's captain that was sailing in the dark of night and saw a light and they knew a collision was about to happen. And so like any protocol and any good captain, the captain got on the communications network and said and radioed to the ship ahead. And he said this, he says, change your course 10 degrees it's protocol the reply came back change your course 10 degrees okay folks you don't do that in the navy all of a sudden the angry captain who is angered by the insubordination radioed this i am a captain change your course south Without missing a beat, the radio signal came back. I am a seaman first class. Change your course south. Now, the captain is enraged. Listen to this. The infuriated captain signaled and said, I am a battleship. Change your course north. Then the final radio signal came in and said this. I'm a lighthouse. You change your course north. Do you know what he was saying was? Pack up your titles. Pack up your commands. Pack up all that you want. You better understand, I'm a lighthouse. I'm not moving anywhere. And folks, don't we seem to do the same thing to God? Don't we seem to kind of keep telling the lighthouse, hey, um, I've done this. I've done this good thing. I've done this thing. And God's going, pack it up. That doesn't work here. And we, we have a moment. Listen to this. Today, you can change your course. Today, you can melt the heart of God. If you can hear this, if you're breathing, then a miracle can happen today. That miracle is called being born again. But you can't control if that, white, that lighthouse is going to move. You better recognize you're going to have to find that humility to go, God, it's not a matter of my achievements. My, because this is what people do. God wants to change your life today. He wants to not only change your today, he wants to change your forever. And here's what I want you to understand. How, how do we get forgiveness? How do we get eternal life? Listen to it. Well, I was baptized. Well, I, I go to church. I'm religious. My parents were religious people. I hear this all the time. I'm a good person. I'm, I'm, I'm here today, and aren't I? I had my first communion. I was christened. I went to synagogue. I went to mosque. Look at me. Online, look at me. Pack it up. Those don't work with the lighthouse. I'm telling you right now. Because what you're telling God, here's what the Bible says. The Bible is very clear. Jesus says these words. Here comes from the lighthouse. You ready? Listen, balcony. Listen, main floor. Listen, online. No one can see the kingdom of God unless they are born again. 
That's the lighthouse. So when you say, I'm a good person, you know what you're telling? You're telling the lighthouse to move. You're going like, no, 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 I got this. I'm born. If Jesus is saying, no man can see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again. So you're going to tell him, I'm a good person. I don't hurt anybody. I haven't harmed. I have, I'm a good father. I pay the bills of the family. That's not what Jesus said in John 3.3. 3. Jesus said, you must be born again. Folks, the lighthouse isn't going to move. The lighthouse, it's going to cause, it's going to call for humility to pack up all of our achievements. I went to synagogue. I come from a religious background. I went to the mosque. I went did this. I fasted. I rode a bicycle for my, for my religious and did this for two years. I gave up two years to go on the mission. I carried a briefcase around all throughout the streets. You could pack it all up. You have to be born again. You could pack it all up. There's nothing that you can say that is going to begin to change the lighthouse. You've got to show the humility. You've got to show the humility. And today, this, is, this can change your today and your forever. Well, Pastor Tim, how does that happen? Jesus uses the phrase, you must be born again. To say you must be born again, you can't make optional. What Jesus says is a necessity. He uses a phrase, be born again. What he was saying was this, just as you've been born once, you need a second birth. The first time, was physically the second time is spiritually the first time a doctor may have delivered you but the second time it's God delivering you that's what he does well pastor Tim how does it happen okay you ready for this it's as simple as ABC words that we say to elementary kids each one of those letters correspond to the journey here it is a admitting that I'm a sinner that every one of us, every one of us in this place, whether you're a, a businessman that lives in a penthouse and a CEO that lives in a penthouse, or whether you're a single mom that's living on aid in government housing, let me just tell you, we all have a condition and it's called sin. You can't fix it by a promise, a program. There's not a priest or a pastor. There's no one that can fix it except God himself. Every one of us have that condition. In fact, one person says like this, we're not mistakers in need of correction. We're sinners in need of a savior. We don't need a second chance. We need a second birth. How does that happen, Pastor Tim? It's the B word. Believe that God sent his son to die on the cross for me. It's believing that I couldn't fix myself. This is getting out of the way of the lighthouse. That I needed someone to come and change me from the inside out. Because if I could get to heaven by all my accomplishments, that, I, that I've been pulling out of the bag to show God, then why would God have to send his son to die for me? It'd be ridiculous. He died the death that I was supposed to die, lived the life that I couldn't live to give me a reward that I didn't deserve. He became my sin bearer. And then finally at sea, confessing him as Lord, saying, you are in charge. Romans 10, 9 and 10. When you say the word Lord, it means you're the boss now. Not the boss for two hours on Sunday when I'm sitting in the building. You're the boss every single day. You're the boss over my marriage. You're the boss over my thoughts. You're the boss over my parenting. You're the boss on everything that I do. You're in charge of my life. Jesus didn't come 2,000 years ago, die on the cross to get you to sit in a seat on Sunday for an hour and a half. Jesus came 2,000 years ago, not to get you to church on Sunday, but to get you to heaven forever. That's what he came to do for everyone here. If you're here today, I want you to bow your head and close your eyes, wherever you're at, balcony. If you're watching online, I want you to listen carefully. But those in this building, close your eyes and bow your head. I want to ask you a question. It's the most important question anyone can ever ask you. Have you been born again? Life doesn't change. I'm asking you to, to pack your bags and get rid of them and go, God, here I am. I'm a sinner. I need help. Because everybody's trying to get perfect. Everybody's trying to get good and come to God. You don't get good and come to God. You come to God and he makes us good. That can change for you today. Watching online around the world, this can be the moment. Whether you're watching from Africa, whether you're from Nigeria or you're watching from Egypt, whether you're from Saudi or you're watching from, from, from Budapest, whether you're, you're watching from Russia or the Ukraine, God wants to change you today. The miracle can happen. The awful story can end with humility that changes everything, everything today. Pastor Tim, what do I need to do? I want to invite you to pray a prayer with me. I want to invite you to start a journey with God today. 
And if you're here with every head bowed and every eye closed, and you'd say, and even watching online, I want you to listen. If you're here in this place and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, it's not a magic prayer, but when you pray that prayer, I want to be included in that. I want to start a journey with God today. Maybe a friend invited you, or maybe you're going to be listening on a Thursday or a Friday. God can work at any day of the week. But if you're here right now and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that prayer, I want to be put in that prayer. I want to be part of that. If that's you and you say, Pastor Tim, include me in that born again prayer. Every head bowed and every eye closed without any hesitation. If you're sitting in this place today, I want you to hold your hand up high. Say, put me in that prayer today. Hold it up high. I want to make sure I see it. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33. Keep them up. Anyone in the balcony? 34. I just want to make sure 35, 36, 37. Can we give thank God for those that lifted up their hands today? Come on. I want all of us to pray this prayer with them. Come on. Everybody in this place, say this with me. Dear Lord Jesus. Come on, you online, pray with me. Say it again. Dear Lord Jesus, you are the Son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me, so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven, a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Okay, come on now, say it loud. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name. Come on, can we thank God for that today? Hallelujah! Hey, can we just give God, I just, I just have to say this, before I get, tell you what a next step is, just in-house, this doesn't even count online, just in-house, we've had 75 people commit their life to Jesus for the very first time. Come on, folks, we wanna get as many to heaven as we can. Now, because of protocol, here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. If you are one of those that raised their hand, if you're watching online, I want you to text the word CONNECT to 51,000. Some of you are going like, I thought that was if you're visiting. We do everything through that, everything through that. We'll give you what your next steps are to help you on this brand new journey of what God's asked you to do.